Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Roy. My home group is the Suffering Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's located in Rockland County. My sobriety date, by the grace of God, and by working these 12 steps and getting them in my life on a daily basis the best I can, which is poor, I'll tell you, is February 17, 1974, and for that I'm truly grateful. This is, um, this is the 38th annual CINI Conventions Old Timer Meeting. And we're going to have eight old-timers come up here and speak for about seven minutes apiece. Which is better than six, but not as good as 20. You know, if you drink, if you drink, you have two things to worry about. You're either an alcoholic or you're not an alcoholic. If you're not an alcoholic, you have nothing to worry about. If you're an alcoholic, you have two things to worry about. You'll either quit clean up your, your life or you'll go to AA. If you go to AA, you have nothing to worry about. And I done blew this joke. Um, which is funny in itself. But I'm going to tell it anyway. If you continue to drink, you got two things to worry about. You'll either go insane or you'll die. If you go insane, you have nothing to worry about. If you die, you have two things to worry about. You'll either go to heaven or you'll go to hell. If you go to heaven, you have nothing to worry about. If you go to hell, you have one thing to worry about. Where in hell can you get another drink? Our first speaker tonight is from the St. Albans group, David S. Please come up, David. Good afternoon, my friends. My name is David and I am an alcoholic. The most important thing that I can share up here today is to say that I'm a very, very grateful alcoholic. And, uh, and I'm grateful for the fact that uh, I don't have to listen to that joke about going to hell. <laughs> um, truly, I, I want to thank every one of you for being out there today in my life. Those that I have seen, those that I've met, and those that I've not met. I'm a strong believer in the fellowship and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It has done for me exactly what it promised that it would do. Exactly 32 years ago, I walked into this room, and sometimes somebody would sort of debate that issue as to whether I walked in. But I got here anyhow. And... uh the first person I hear to share is a person that most of us know. And her name was Liz, uh, Liz Bailey. She had no, no problem with it. And she got up and she's standing up here, just like I'm standing up here now. And I'm just looking at her. She was a good looking gal. Yeah. Now, I didn't see, and she, you know, I, I, I looked at her because she looked good to me. <laughs> She looked much better than those that I knew before. <laughs> but uh, she shared exactly what I'm saying, going to share now. And she said, my name is Liz, and I'm a grateful alcoholic. Now, she stopped being pretty after that. I could not figure out why she would want to say it. And she screamed it. I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I haven't forgotten that. And since then, I understand the meaning of gratitude. Through this fellowship, I've learned that gratitude is a thanksgiving for things that I never earned. And if I had to earn my way here, I probably would have lost. But it's by the grace of God that I'm here. And I'm here, I'm here really, you know, and I, and, and I want you to just share this very briefly with you. I'm here because I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it's, it's true that I'm good looking and handsome. But that's not why I'm here. <laughs> it's, 
It's true that I got enough degrees to talk about for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I am powerless over alcohol. I'm powerful, powerless over the ism, alcoholism. I'm one of those who believe and not uh, talking about what it's about. And that is, uh, if I, if, if, if milk did to me what alcohol did, I would tell y'all I'm a milkaholic. <laughs> alcohol did it. I drank in high places. I drank in strange places. I drank any place. I drink when I wanted to, drink when I didn't want to, just drink because I had to. And I suffer from a disease. And if you don't have it, keep coming. Guarantee you, you'll get it. <laughs> I walked in here and I didn't know that what an alcoholic was. And uh, they told me that they had a bunch of people like you who would share their strength, their hope, and their experience so that I could discover who I was and what I was and that I could do something about it. I found that hope. And I've been trying. I've been trying. You see, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of these old timers who tell you that I, I you know, I, I carry the message and my message is the best message. And if you don't get mine, you're going to die. That's your problem. I'm going to give it to you whether you like it or not. Because that's what it is all about. And I've been able to carry this message a day at a time. I will go to any length. And I have gone to any length for these last 32 years. And I thank God that I'm able to do this. I'm saying that most of you, I'm looking at this row of people up here. And most of y'all knew me when I was handsome and had curly hair. <laughs> Got nothing to do with me being an alcoholic. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm one of those who drink everywhere. And I'm one of those guys who cannot tell you his story. I really don't know it. Most of my story was done in a blackout. And I have to sort of put it pieces of it together since I've been here. I'm the type of guy who would go out and I've been, you know, in my handsome self and all of my, you know, I had a few bucks in my pocket and I, and on Friday night, you know, I was going to go home. I had a good job. I had a good occupation. My intention was to go home. And I tell you what, I meant to go home. And I would leave. But every week, my office was down there on uh, 7th Avenue and, and uh, 32nd, uh, 42nd Street. And I lived in Queens. But I could come home, and I didn't know this until after I got sober. The shortest cut to my house is up the, uh, across Island Parkway. And then down into Rosedale where I live. But there was a little place called Brinkerhoff. And, uh, and it was right off of Linden Boulevard and Van White. And my car would never, never stop. When I got there, it automatically turned. And I would go down and they'd be just waiting for me. And I now know why they was waiting. Because they knew more about me than I knew about myself. And I'm going to share this and close this down because it was there that I found my bottom. And through the grace of God, a day at a time, I've been coming this way. I came until I got honest about my drinking. I came until I was able to open up my mind. And I became as willing to listen as only the dying can be. I came until... You gave me the hope that I never had for myself. And I came until I was able to put these principles in all my affairs. I came until I got to the place today that I got the message that I can give to anybody. And I'm going to give this message to you because all of you want to know, how do you become an old timer? I, I can tell you, don't, don't, don't worry about it. It's very simple. Don't you drink and don't you die. Thank you for letting me share. Must be from the city. She brought her purse up here with her. Thank you.
Thank you. My name is Antoinette, and I am definitely a risk for recovering alcoholic. Uh, first, I'd like to thank God for allowing me to be here today. And thank you for all the people that are in my life. This is my first time here to see it. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank God for my sponsors that I came in here in 1973 for Joe Chaplin was one of my sponsor, Freddie B. And Donna R is my sponsor. And I'm grateful for my sponsors for helping to show me how to stay sober. Because when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't come in here to stop drinking. I'm sorry, I'm crying. <laughs> but I came into Alcoholics Anonymous because I almost cut one of my daughter's head off. And I asked God there had to be a better way because I didn't want to hurt any of my children. You know, and a friend of mine carried me to ATC Alcoholic Treatment Center. And uh, I love tall men because tall men, I like the way they walk, you know. And um, so um, God saw fit to put two tall men in my life. <laughs> um, and But I had to learn uh, what my purpose was, you know, and uh, make sure my motives was good. <laughs> you know, but um, he gave me a counselor. He was tall. <laughs> he gave me my sponsor. He's tall, you know. And I met a whole lot of tall ones, you know. But I married a little short guy. But um, but um, you know. And um, this has been a journey for me in Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm 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 happy, you know. I raised five grandkids here. I have four children. I have 14 grandchildren. And all of them are grown and gone. I'm glad. <laughs> One of them is talking about they want to come back home and live with me. No. <laughs> nah. <laughs> it's time for me to live. <laughs> you know, and I'm grateful. I'm really grateful because I never thought that I would ever get up here. And I'd like to thank God, my sponsee, Brenda and Thelma, for bringing me up here. Because I wasn't going to, uh, you know, she said, you ain't got no babies at home. Well, what are you staying home for? You know, and uh, God willing, in July, uh, last Saturday in July, hopefully I'll be celebrating 31 years. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim D. from the Lincoln Park Group. All right, Jimmy. While he's on his way up here, I just let you know, um, I, I, got a, I got a list up here of, of, uh, of people, of old timers, and uh and there's a few that didn't make the sign up. I got Mickey because I know Mickey. I wrote him down, but there's a couple others. And when my total so far is a thousand and sixty years of sobriety. So with the uh, two or three that I missed, it's going to be over eleven hundred, one thousand one hundred, eleven hundred years of sobriety. And uh, that's a tribute to Alcoholics Anonymous, not to anybody's individual effort. It's a group effort. We need each other. And here's Jimmy. Hi, right, folks. Good afternoon. My name is Jim, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I come from a family of alcoholics on both sides, on my father's side and my mother's side. And the few that weren't alcoholics themselves proceeded to marry one, make sure there's one in every household. <laughs> <clears throat> but even as a kid, before I ever had a drink, I used to love to go after church, go into the bars with my uncles and have the potato chips and Coca-Cola. And I watched the people at the bar, and I loved the atmosphere even then. Couldn't wait to get up there myself. And pretty soon I did. I started with the uh, schoolyard. I got the phony draft card. And the trouble came with it. I was in uh, reform school. I, when I joined the military, I was uh, in the stockade a few times. And uh, blackouts were a lot. And, and uh, I, one of my escapades got me incarcerated up in Rikers Island one time. I woke. I celebrated my 21st birthday over there. And uh, I said, I said, I got to do something about this drinking when I. But as much as you didn't like being uh, in jail, I was almost afraid to get out. 
you know, I said, at least I had the safety of not getting any trouble anymore. And I would remember what I did the night before. And uh, so I, I got out of there, and uh, you know, when you get these assault charges and get locked up, I was wondering what, what happened. It's always me that was all full of blood and banged up. I said, didn't the other guy get charged with assault too? <laughs> but uh, but that got, when I got out, of, got out of there, I said I have to do something about my drinking. And what I did about it was to say, go drink at different bars with different friends. Those guys were getting me in trouble. <laughs> but uh, but after that time, they changed a lot. The, the violence stopped. I was, I, was not, I was afraid to get in the fights or anything. The booze changed from giving me the beer uh, coverage to going the other way. And, uh, you know, what got me, the violence didn't get me in there. It was the, just the, the loneliness of being in a bar and knowing a lot of people and drinking and uh, just trying to be being different than everybody else, even though you knew most people. And uh, I, don't know, I remember one time, the last episode, I, people at my job were getting me blind dates. And uh, I, I go up with a, I said, let me be, be good on this blind date. So I go up with the girl and we dance around. I had a, a gin and tonic. You know. Gin and tonic is what I had when I didn't drink. Because I didn't consider that drinking. I hated gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I danced around with this girl. And oh, that, I was madly in love. And towards the end of the night, she says, you want to go to one more place? And I was on my good behavior. And the, the scotch was flowing and all. I started to have a few of them. And then I looked at my watch and said, gee, if I can get rid of her, I can get back to the Bronx and start drinking again. And that, that's so good. A half hour before, I wanted to spend a lifetime with this girl. This is the first met her. And that night, I couldn't get uh, really drunk and couldn't get sober. I said, uh, you know, I, I finally admitted I'm powerless over it. I can't, uh, you know, change my mind about everything. The booze. I can't even socialize. I'm losing my job. I finally got a, a spiritual awakening or something. But... Uh, I didn't stop drinking that same night, but I gradually got oh, up until that final in January. I stopped and uh, become another since, and I had a lot of help with people in here. That's for sure, and uh, that's about it. Thank you. I think we'll have to get Kathleen up here and draw out a couple more names because I think we're going to have more than eight speakers. But we'll wait and see. Somebody may be a little long-winded. Other than me, William H. from the Claremont Group. You get up those steps? All right, okay. There you go. There's nothing good. <laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Bill H., and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. First of all, I want to give thanks to God, to the 12, 12. Next, I'd like to thank Al-Anon for being Al-Anon. My wife went to Al-Anon to learn how to live with an alcoholic, and I threatened to beat her butt. How could I be an alcoholic? But I got, she, she came home one day and told me to get dressed. We were going out. And I got happy. <laughs> but she wouldn't let me go nowhere <laughs> around our family and friends. And I went in the bathroom, ran the tub full of water, put some of her clone in there, and it was smelling good in there. And I sat on the side of the tub singing and splashing. Yeah! I got dressed. I put on a brand new suit, put on the same old underwear I had on for this. And I tied a beautiful Wednesday knot with a white shirt, black shoes, white stitching. And I walked out and I looked at her and I said, how do I look? And she said, you still stink. (laughs) And finally we left and I was walking. And when we got to 169th Street, I said, hey, where are we going? She said, you going to an AA meeting. 
I said, I ain't going no damn where. And she grabbed me by my tie. <laughs> and I said, okay, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and I went into that meeting, Bronx, Lebanon. And as I walked in, she called me back. And I can't say what I want to say because of children. And my wife didn't, doesn't still use a whole lot of vulgarity. But you can identify. She said, go inside your little dumb MF and see if you can learn anything. <laughs> I walked into the room and I sat down and I kept the focus on her. <laughs> when the meeting is over, I'm going to beat her up. But... Uh, a strange thing happened that night. There was a man named John W. Sharon. He said, if you have a problem with alcohol, we're in the right place. He said, you got to do one thing. You got to get honest with yourself about your drinking. And in time, you get honest in other areas. And from that day on, the program began to work. I got sponsors. I listen to people from all walks of groups in life, and everything's okay. I am coming up on my 32nd. My wife and I will be married next month for 55 years. And in May, I'll be, God be willing, I'll be 79. So I just want to say to the newcomer, used to say and still do, you're the most important person. But you got to keep coming. If you want what we have, you got to do what we do. And I, I'll say this and then I'm going to get down. My sponsor, the late Virginia, they know her. She saw me walk into the room one day, and there was a lady sitting with her legs crossed and a little gap. And I walked by and I looked. And she said, come here, you little son of a so-and-so. <laughs> she took me into the kitchen at Claremont. And that woman greened me out for about 10 minutes. And when I walked out of that room, I knew why I was in AA. Get sober, stay sober, reach out, and help another suffering alcoholic. That's what you taught me. And my life has been beautiful. Traveling here and there to the Bahamas, this place and the other. But everywhere I went, I made a meeting. And my wife and I, we travel together. That's my best friend. She's my wife. But I got to say one thing. I love you all. Thank you. Next speaker is Kathy B. Courage to change. While she's coming up here, I want to I want to um, let you know that my sponsor Valentine M, who's uh, a little bit under the weather with his health, sends his greetings and wishes you all a very uh, happy and uh, joyous convention. Kathy. Hi everybody. My name is Kathy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And shocked. Um, I really did not expect to have my name pulled out of this uh, out of the box. But when I came yesterday and I signed up, I said to him, uh, you know, I thought once I reached 25, they're going to do it the 30 years. But thank God they didn't. You know, I'm just truly grateful this afternoon to be here. I'm grateful to God, first of all, and I'm grateful to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and to the fellowship for the love that I have received, the unconditional love from the people in the rooms who truly accepted me as I was and who truly taught me how to live. 
through working the steps and through trying to practice the principles of this program. And I'm grateful to my mother who is here today with me, you know, who has stood by me through thick and thin. You know, um, this program works. You know, Bill H. was one of the first people that I met when I first came in. Um, I went to a meeting, and he said to me, um, you know, you got to get honest about your drinking. He said, you know, go home and pour out all the liquor that you have. And I thought he was out of his mind at that time. And I'm here to tell you that I never thought that I'd be celebrating 25 years. I didn't think I'd get 25 seconds. But, you know, um, this program works if you work it, if you get active, if you get involved. And I was a very selfish and self-centered person. But it gives me such great pleasure to try and give back some of what has been freely and truly given to me. And I just don't know what else to say, but I'm grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm grateful to you all and just... Thank you so much for letting me share. We may get them all to speak. They're that, they're that short. John W. from the Pelham Group, I think. My name's John. I'm an alcoholic. I, uh, I've been to this convention many, many, many times, and uh, I always enjoy this particular meeting. Everybody does. You know, this is the uh, backbone of the whole convention, almost. And uh, I was always wondering whether I'd ever make it up here or not. You know, and and uh, now I'm scared. <laughs> and it's funny because. Uh, I always tell my, my sponsor who doesn't come up to these meetings, uh, these conventions and I tell him, uh, you gotta come up, you gotta come up. And he says, uh, what's the big deal? And I said, you gotta go to the old timers meeting. You know, and he's got almost 40 years of sobriety. And, uh, so what happened was he says, what happens at these old timers meetings? I said, a lot of people get up there and they're really funny, you know, and some are really serious, but it's great. And, uh, so I, so I did one time at the Westchester Roundup, uh, they had a little old timers, uh, group, and I signed them up for it. You know? I mean, if you want to get even with your sponsor, that's what you do. <laughs> I mean, for all the stuff he put me through, uh, you know. And, uh, when I told him, he says, what do I have to do? And I said, you gotta be funny. Now, now, if you know my sponsor, that's a stretch, a, a long, long stretch. You know, he told me it took him three years before he even smiled in the AA, you know. And uh, and also that, I uh, hope he's not here, but <laughs> my sponsor looks a lot like Dr. Kowalkian. You know, the suicide doctor? Uh, and uh, before he got, uh, before his d- doctor... Dr. K got famous, you know, my sponsor did a lot of sponsees, and after the doctor came famous, he had no more sponsees, you know, I think they're all afraid of him, so, uh, anyway, uh, I'm losing my thought here, uh, uh, I used to come to this meeting a lot, and, and I always enjoyed the whole convention, you know, and uh, I came into AA, uh, my anniversary date is August of 77. Uh, I think that's a special month because that was also the month that uh, Elvis Presley died. It was also the month that they, they caught the uh, the son of Sam Killer. And, and I came into AA. <laughs> I, like, I like to think of it as the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> I uh, I got to AA through my job, uh, employee assistant program, and uh, I had to make a commitment to, to keep my job, and uh, uh, I, I had to make a commitment to, to try to stay sober, and they gave me 90 90, and I said, what was that? And, you know, they explained it. He told me that uh, I want you to go 
every day, I mean, go to a meeting every day, and the next day you call me up and tell me what meeting you went to and what the topic was about. So this guy was, this guy was slick, you know. And I did that, you know, and the guy's name was George. And, and every day I'd call him up and tell him what meeting I went to, what the topic was about, and uh, it just kept on going. And when I hit 30 days, I called George. I said, George, I got 30 days in. He said, big deal. You know, and George, of course, was in the program. And I never heard anybody talk to a, a newcomer like that, you know. So I went back to my meetings, and when I hit 60, I said, George, I got 60 days. He says, what do you want, a brass band? <laughs> you know, talk about tough love, you know. I mean, so when I hit 90, I decided not to say anything. And George said, John, you got 90 days in? I said, well, what's it to you, you know? <laughs> but he also, he also asked me one more thing. He said, well, what do you think, John? And uh, of course, I've been to a lot more meetings than 90 meetings. I read all the literature and everything. And I said, I think he got me. That's all I said. I think he got me. And uh, that started the journey, you know, and I came to the program and went to the meetings, and uh, I thought this was, uh, I thought AA was purgatory, you know? You're not, you're not in hell, like we were talking about, and you're not in heaven, you're just in the middle. It's like I used to drink, I used to be in the middle, mocus, you know? And uh, I hated uh, going to these boring meetings with these boring people. I looked around the rooms, and I said, I wouldn't even drink with these people, you know? <laughs> now, not that you were any better or any worse than me, you just weren't my type. And, and I still haven't figured what that is yet, but I'm, I'm working on it, you know. And uh, I, I was like my sponsor. I wasn't, I wasn't a very happy camper, you know. And, and finally, uh, I was going through these meetings, and eventually I went to a meeting where somebody said something that was just absolutely hilarious, you know, and a whole group just cracked up. And, and it was the first time I laughed. I remember that because it wasn't even a good laugh. It was more like a ha. I couldn't say ha ha. I could just say ha. But but it broke the ice. And and I remember that. You know, that was a long time ago, and I still remember that. Ha. So uh, there's a lot of laughs in AA if you keep on coming, you know. And uh, I, I just uh, want to thank everybody uh, for listening to me and have a nice convention. Thanks. Next speaker is Donald R. He's coming up here. Kathleen, I want you to come up. We're going to draw some more names out. So come on up. While Donald's walking up here, he's, he's in the back there a little bit further. He's one of the late registrants. Good afternoon, my name is Donald. I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I was walking slow like that because I pulled a muscle in my hip. And it ain't got nothing to do with time. <laughs> you know, we're going to get that straight right away. You know, I mean, uh, I want to give I want to give thanks to God for waking me up this morning and getting me up here to the scene without any accidents or anything. You know, because God is good. You know what I mean? Oh, it's good. I know he's good. Else I wouldn't be standing up here. Because the life I live, by all rights, I shouldn't even be here. But he's so fit for me to come to this program. You know, it's times like this. There's one man name I always mention. And some people in there know him. But I never came to call his numbers. His name is Eddie G. And we were drinking a pint of wine up his house. And the next morning he said, I'm going back. And I said, going back where? He said, I thought he was talking about going back to the liquor store. <laughs> he said, I'm going back to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the only place that I go, and everything seems to go all right. And I don't know why to this day, I said, I'll go with you. But you know, the big book talks about alcoholics with false pride. I was on SSI, and I was in between checks. So I said, let's wait to check day. <laughs> 
I thought you had to be dressed up. And I stayed up at his house for eight days. When we went to the store, we went to the store together. I didn't know we was 12-stepping each other. And my check came. And I, I'm a clothes fanatic, so I ran downtown. And it was summertime, and I bought a fly soft sleeve shirt, a pair of wingtip shoes, and at that time, dyke pants was out. You know, I didn't want y'all to know how bad I was doing. I weighed 140 pounds. I'm six foot two. Both pockets was meeting each other. <laughs> my eyes, my eyes, uh, two people sitting in the front row laughing. They know me when I came in. You know, and I didn't think nothing was wrong with me. You know what I mean? And, uh, I was coming down Park Avenue and, uh, and uh, a guy I knew, he had two arms full of watches. I don't know where he broke into. But I knew you had to have a watch to come in here because if you got a watch on, you ain't doing bad. You know what I mean? And I bought a watch off of him. And I was clean that night, and God got a funny sense of humor. It poured rain. <laughs> and I looked like I got out the washer when I walked down. I remember going down to Mid Harlem, down that long walkway. And that was my first meeting. And uh when that door, my light shines out, it's like a movie. And I walked through there, and a little guy named George G. was standing with a name tag on it. I hadn't had a drink in eight days, and he jumped from behind there and said, Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and, and he told me a funny thing. He said, we were waiting on you. <laughs> I don't even know this guy. And I looked at Eddie, I said, what's with him? And they marched us out. At that time, they used to march you down front. They wouldn't let you, they wouldn't let you go get no coffee because I was going to go out the door. I had about $300 in my pocket. And they was talking about not drinking. The first drink gets you drunk. And I looked at, I looked at Eddie. I said, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> first paint? Yeah. You know, but, uh, I couldn't get out the door. And, you know, I made a mistake that, uh, I see a lot of my friends in here that got a lot of time, 30 years and all that. I made a mistake in spite of myself. That everybody makes a good time. I made one meet too many. <laughs> it just started making sense. <laughs> All of a sudden, this cleared up a little bit. And I began to realize the first drink, do you get you drunk? Because I remember I used to work in the post office. And when I got paid, I said, I'm going to have one drink. And I go in the bar, and I remember exactly what I said when I took the drink. Ah. Whew, that thing tastes so good. I said, give me one more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that cleared that up. And then they told me about uh people, places, and things. And I always say, what I'm gonna do. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anybody when I came back all the time. People coming in now say, Oh, this where you been? I thought you was dead. I ain't know nobody. You know what I mean? And uh I long for my friends, you know. They clipped me, I clipped them, you know what I mean? But they, they were my friends. They robbed my house, I robbed their house, you know what I mean? <laughs> but they were my friends, you know what I mean? And, uh, them the only ones I had, you know what I mean, and um, I was the type of person, uh, people in here were too kind, it had to be a gimmick, it had to be a gimmick, nobody just don't do that in the street, it's always something behind it, sit down, welcome, we love, a man told me we love you till we love you, yeah right, I didn't, I didn't buy that one too tough, what do you mean he loved me till I learned to love myself, you know what I mean, because you know, where I came from you didn't say that to a man, you know. It took me a long time to hug a man in here. You know, I look over my shoulder when the guy hugged me. What's wrong with him? But you know what? All them cliches and things you learn in the street just start dropping. Because you start getting comfortable. And you realize that people are really here to help you. And you know the funniest thing I heard a guy say in the meeting this morning? A guy or a lady, I don't remember which one. I never heard anybody in here say, I hope you go out and get drunk. I heard people say, if you keep messing with me, I'm punching your mouth. Keep talking to my old lady, I'm going to do something bad to you. But I never heard nobody say, I hope you go get drunk. You know what I mean? And I have had people told me, I hope you die. I've had people say, I hope you drop dead. You know what I mean? So I'm here, and I'm here to stay. And I don't change nothing. I keep the program simple. You know? I, I might have 31 years, but that don't mean nothing. That's yesterday. I better worry about today. You know, I'm getting ready to go to a restaurant right now, and most restaurants say, would you like a drink before you eat? You know, yeah, water. You know what I mean? See, because I know what it'll do to me. You know what I mean? Uh, they be escorting me out of this town. 
out of this town. You know what I mean? So I, I keep it simple. You know what I mean? And uh, I try to help another, like Dave said, I try to help another circle of alcohol. And I do the same things I did when I got 90 days. I'm still active with a group. I can have on a jogging suit, a three-piece suit. But I didn't have a suit when I got in. I didn't have a job. I didn't have an apartment. I didn't have a wife. And I didn't have good sense. You know what I mean? And all that began to come back. And I'm grateful. Grateful alcoholics show up. They don't be too busy. They don't say, I don't go to Brooklyn. I went to Timbuk too for a drink. You know what I mean? So I, I sign up for commitments for my group. I try to help myself in alcohol. I give my phone. I might not give my address. Now, I got to see if you rap too tight first. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, people coming in here, uh, you know what I mean? They're using different things, and they're talking to themselves and jerking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like that when I came in, you know what I mean? So, uh, so if you knew, stay here. This program works. You know what I mean? They call us old-timers, but I don't like that. I always say I'm a long-timer. Who call me no old-timer, you know what I mean? I say I got a little bit of age, but I got a young body. And my wife said, you want me to help you out the bed? <laughs> I want to thank you very much. This is our eighth speaker and our final one because we're going to go in overtime here. Maurice. Uh, my name is Maurice, and I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I, I do mean grateful. And I'm glad to be here. And as I always say, I'm glad to be anywhere at this stage in my life. Uh, I used to be very funny when I was drinking. I used to be the life of the party. And I came in AA, and I can't remember jokes anymore. So I'm not like these gentlemen. I mean... Uh, what they talked about is unbelievable and it's funny and everything. It proves to me one thing. We're not taking ourselves seriously. And I was told that when I came in the program. Take your sobriety serious, but do not take yourself seriously. And I don't. I joke a lot when I came in here. Uh, I heard the gentleman say he don't like the word old timers. But there's one guy in here, I don't want to mention names, he keeps calling me an old-timer. And I want to know whether he's calling me because of my age or because of the time I have in here. And uh, unfortunately, I have no sponsors now. They all passed away. The last one died, oh, about three years ago. We had like 40 years of sobriety. So my sponsors are my sponsees now. We call each other every day. And I have my group and have you people. Uh, I gotta find me a sponsor. I do. Because you must have a sponsor. You must have somebody that you can share with. And, uh, I always say that I lost a lot when I came in the program. I lost the blackouts. I lost all my three for ones. I used to go in the bar. You know, the bartender used to come in and he used to pour and he used to walk in. I miss when I used to get dressed with my, uh, I'm dating myself. Used to be a place called Layton's and I used to buy my $200 suits and I used to get my hats custom made at Santini's, 116th Street and Lennox and my shoes and everything. Get shop, get dressed as the gentleman said. Wake up the next morning in my puke. Okay, that's what, uh, I miss. Uh, and I miss waking up. And turning around and saying, holy, give me another drink. <laughs> Happened to me quite a few times. Anyway, uh, I'm grateful for this program. I'm grateful for everyone that's here today. Uh, and like I said, uh, I saw Mickey. He uh, snuck by me today. That's one of my old buddies. Uh, he knew me when I first came around <clears throat> with the Sobriety Unlimited group. And uh, this program works. It's very simple. I keep it simple. I was told when I came in, don't drink, go to meetings. 
get a sponsor. And that's what I do. That's what I did. And it works one day at a time. And uh, I'm glad to be here again. And uh, it's been <clears throat> March 5th, 1966. I put down the 5th. That's the way that I look at it. And uh, it's been quite a quite a ride. Quite a ride. And I take my sobriety very seriously, as I said. But I'm glad to be here. I had all the isms before I got here. Okay? But this program does work. And uh, proof of the pudding is we all here today. And I always say, don't count my 38 years. I always give the finger. One day. One day at a time is the way I made it. Just like it's going to date me again when you say how you get to Carnegie Hall. You practice, practice, practice. How you get 38 years, day at a time, day at a time, day at a time. That's the way it works. Very simple. One day at a time, you don't drink, you go to meetings, you get involved, you talk to your people, your sponsors, your sponsors, and the program does work. And uh, tonight, I'm celebrating 38 years. Thank you. Uh, our first uh, overtime speaker is a is a name that just went in the box too because they just told me, Ivy. Where are you, Ivy? Oh, there she is, way back there. While she's coming up here, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about this Alanon, who uh, who bought her husband a cemetery lot for Christmas one year, and the next Christmas uh, came and went, and she didn't buy him nothing. And he said, why didn't you buy me a Christmas present this year? She said, you didn't use last year's present. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivy, and I'm an alcoholic. I was just told seven or eight minutes. And most of you that know me know I'm good for an hour, one hour, but I won't do that. I'm very honored to be up here, and I'm very glad to be at the uh, convention. And um, I came, I drank for 32 years, <clears throat> and I've been sober for 32 years. Uh, I came into AA because I was tired, and I got up this this particular morning and put on a clean dress, no bath, just ran the rag across my face and said I'm going to see about myself because I drank too much. And I went to a metropolitan hospital and told the psychiatrist, I said, you know I drank too much. Please do something for me. He sent me to the National Council on Alcoholism. And <clears throat> from I'm so glad they didn't keep me because it's not a fellowship. It's an organization. And this man took me over across the street to Inner Group, which was on 28th Street and Lexington Avenue. And here I met this lady, and she was supposed to be my, she was to be my sponsor, but I didn't know it. And she said, well, come on in, honey. If you stay till 3 o'clock, i buy you a pack of cigarettes. And I was grumbling. I said, why she want me to stay till 3 o'clock? I got to get out of here and buy, write a bum check so I can get this liquor. <laughs> but I stayed because I smoked cigarettes, and I haven't smoked in 27 years. Um, anyway, she was sitting down checking off the meeting this book, and she said, and you'll get yourself a sponsor? I said, aha. Cause see, I know what the sponsor was out there in them bars. You know, you sit on the stool with your dress a little bit above your knee and kind of bent over a little bit and you automatically had a sponsor. <laughs> so, that's, that's, that's where my mind went straight, right straight there. 
But anyway, she told me, said, the next Friday, I want you to go to the mustard seed. And I went to the mustard seed, and I cased the joint. So, um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I, I went, like she told me, and I went to the liquor store and told the liquor store man, I said, they say I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm a problem drinker. But they didn't say I was an alcoholic. But anyway, the soup and I, we decided that I wasn't an alcoholic. And we kept right on drinking. But I was still looking in the meeting this book, and I found Mid Harlem. And I went to Mid Harlem. And when I got there, they were on the uh, fourth step. And I raised my hand, and I told them I didn't know about the fourth step, but I knew about the first. And they clapped for me. But see, at that time, he wasn't doing no clapping. And I ran right out of there and went to a friend of mine's house, and I told her I went to that AA, and they clapped for me. Let's drink. So, um, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I couldn't go that Saturday because I had too much of a hangover. So I went that Sunday and to uh, St. Nicholas and then back to Mid Harlem. And they said, don't, the old timers would tell you, don't drink and make meetings and keep coming. And that's what I do. I don't drink and I make meetings and I keep coming. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Eileen G. All right. Hi, everybody. My name's Eileen. I'm an alcoholic. And my home group is the Greenwich Village group of uh, New York City. Um, But my first meeting, like the last speaker, was the mustard seed. And I went to the mustard seed in a blackout. Um, I love to drink. I love to drink. I was a party drunk. And I had a lot of fun with drinking. Um... Except I never knew when to leave the party. I was one of those people that they were praying you would go home, you know? I was one of those people where the guy was sweeping the bar and you were still there. Um, and although it had started out fun, it ended up the way we know it does. And I came to the end of my drinking and uh, I was having a little drink. It was the day of the Kentucky Derby or something. So I was having a little uh, mint julep. Now, I don't know, I don't even know what a mint julep is really, but I was approximating it in my apartment. And I was drunk as usual. And uh, watching the Triple Crown, which took all of about 30 seconds. But I had about five drinks on that. The man I was married to then was passed out in the bedroom with a gun uh, because he was always going to kill himself. Um, And when I got here, I thought I had a very high bottom story. I didn't. (laughs) And by some miracle, I called AA. And the miracle ended up later on down the line uh, had been a contact that was some guy at the office where I worked who was cute, a writer, and he told me he joined AA. And he even asked me, did I want to go to a meeting? I said, no. Uh, but I must have filed that. So I called AA. I was drunk. Uh, I called into group. Guy tried to help me. I wouldn't tell him where I lived. So he's trying to find a meeting for me, and, um, you know, he doesn't know where I live. So anyway, cut a long story short, I ended up drunk, going by cab to the mustard seed. I lived downtown. And I don't remember anything about that meaning, except somebody touched my elbow and said it gets better. And from that day to this, I really don't know what it was, but I think I must have been taken to an anniversary party because I was in an apartment and this woman came out of, you know, the, our typical little kitchens. 
with this big thing of sheet cake. I hadn't eaten cake in about 15 years at that point. And uh, people were drinking Pepsi, and I thought, oh, my God, 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 what am I doing here? What? So I said, I got to leave, and I, I took a cab home. I always have money when I drank. I always took money. If I didn't have mine, I took yours, but I always have money. <laughs> and I passed out, of course. What an adventure, you know. And then the next day was Sunday, and, and with that insanity of the alcoholic, I thought, I'll get a day of health in. You know, I won't drink today. I mean, I was like, I was dying. I was 89 pounds. I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. And um, I thought, I'll get a day of health in. <laughs> and, of course, by 1030 in the morning, um, I knew I was going to drink. And I didn't know what to do. But someone had given me a meeting book. And there was a woman's name and a phone number on it. I have no memory of it. I've never met this woman. Uh, and I called her which was another miracle, my higher power. And uh, she said, you better go to Perry Street. There's uh, 50 Perry Street. There's a meeting. Uh, there'll be one at 2 or 3 o'clock. And I remember saying to her, you know, but I, I, I'm i busy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was very busy, busy dying. So I went to Perry Street, and again, I was late. The meeting was in progress. And I must have explained my situation. I don't know, because they... They knew I was a newcomer, and um, they took me for coffee. Now, I was now going into withdrawal, and I had these problems. My job was leaving town, relocating to Dallas. My husband was going to kill himself if I uh, left the house, and although I thought I was high bottom because I still had a job, um, and his parents had money, so we had everything, uh, we didn't earn, we spent everything. We spent it all on alcohol. Um, but I realized there were these problems. And their answer was, why don't you have some eggs, honey? I have a cup of coffee. I thought, what? Uh, but they knew what I didn't, which was I was in no condition to address anything. Nothing except to keep coming. And that's what I did. And when I was 90 days sober, I made coffee with two cans of coffee instead of one. <laughs> and the first guy that took the coffee said, oh, my God, who made this coffee? And I wanted a drink, you know. And then one of my relatives died, and I wanted a drink. And then one day I thought, this is going to be a long gray tunnel of rectitude and goodness and somebody said to me, buy yourself an umbrella. It was pouring with rain. So I bought one of those long, multi-striped umbrellas. And I lost it the same day, and I wanted a drink. You know what I mean? Everything was whatever happened. I wanted a drink. And I was in love with the wrong person. You know, maybe somebody identifies with that. And... um I mean, I just couldn't, but you know what? It got better. It got better. It got boring. It got fabulous. It got different. It got longer. And uh, it got sobriety through the people of AA, through the steps, the program. I've had adventures beyond my wildest dreams. I've had sorrows like we all do, but I'm here to party. We're here to party. Our lives have been saved, and it is such a privilege to be here with you guys and to celebrate this day. And you just keep coming, and it gets better. So if you're not having that good a time, it's okay. You're in the right place. Keep coming. Celebrate and be the person you were meant to be the day before you were born. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. Next speaker, and probably our last one, Lynn B.
Hi, my name is Lynn. I'm an alcoholic. And my home group is Saturday East in Manhattan, and my sobriety date is 4-10-1978. In this crowd, I'm a beginner old-timer, and very happy to be here. Last year, some of my very close friends threw me a terrific surprise party for my 25th, and I really didn't know it, and they couldn't believe that nosy me did not know the party was coming out but it was a beautiful gesture. I also retired just about a year ago. And I said to my home group, suppose I was drinking these days. I'd be a vegetable. The first month I was retired, I uh, thought of going back to work. I was so exhausted. Because <laughs> everybody volunteered me. They were afraid I'd get bored. <clears throat> but somebody who is active in AA never gets bored. There's plenty of work to do. And thank God I've been part of that. <clears throat> I was thinking that this whole whole thing of old timers, 25 years ago when I went to exchange views, there were three women. There was one of them. We all stayed sober. Now I think the, the ratio is about 50-50. But it didn't matter. It, I was so focused the first year, I really just walked through the first year like a, a zombie. And I just listened to the way other people solve problems. I didn't get into problems till I got a little bit more sober. Uh, when I, I was fortunate enough to go to rehab because I came into AA, my first meeting in January. I decided that it was okay for me to drink wine and beer because that wasn't my problem. Booze, hard booze was my problem. <clears throat> I don't have to tell you the rest of it. There's a woman that goes to my home group, and I remember you when you were drinking. You were so funny coming to meetings. <clears throat> I didn't drink for three hours before the meeting in deference to my friends that weren't drinking, and I thought that was perfectly okay. Um, finally, I, I was in a, an employee assistance program, and they, <clears throat> the therapist said to me, I can't deal with you unless you go to rehab. I didn't know what a rehab was. I didn't know what alcoholism was. When I got there, <clears throat> there was a young woman, <clears throat> my daughter's age, who was one of my roommates. Another young woman came in. I thought she was pregnant, and it was her liver. And they said she'd never make it to the hospital if she had another drink. And there was a flirty fireman who had seven seizures before they carted him off to Roseville. And I had never seen anything like this before. And when they caught on to the fact that I was absolutely terrified, they said, you'll never stay sober scared. I thought, well, you'll never stay sober scared, but what do you do with this? <clears throat> when I came out, my live-in boyfriend, who was in the program, had two years sobriety, had been drinking. And I got so angry. How could you think I went through these horrible 28 days and you're sitting there writing, you know, get well soon cards, and drinking. So for the next couple of weeks, I stayed sober angry. So in the beginning, there were a lot of wrong reasons for staying sober, but thank God I did. And they said, don't hang out with your friends from rehab. And I said, why not? And they said, because if they go out drinking, we'll be too close to you. And six months later, all but one went out. But I realized then how much sobriety did mean to me and I would go to any length. When I was reading through my log before they released me, they had a cute patient, but they didn't mean it as a compliment. And uh, he said, Need is a tough sponsor. And I got one, but I got one who, after the meeting, if somebody was having a hard time, went and put her arm around the person. And it was very kind, and I thought, I'll, I have to have tough, but I need compassion too. She's still my sponsor. And now she's teaching me how to get old. She's in a nursing home. And uh, she'll be teaching me how to die pretty soon. But I could never have gone through any of this the way I was going. When I said, when I first heard dealing with life on life's terms, I thought, what is this? But now I'm grateful I've gotten to a point where I'm not fighting everything anymore. I'm taking it and seeing, is this something I can do with it? talking to my friends for input, never doing anything alone, never happy to be alone. It's such a blessing. 
And I look at my friends who were drinking 25 years ago and are drinking today and didn't have that, what I thought at first was a horrible thing, come in and change your whole life. And they're still the same as they were 25 years ago. And they still have the same problems that I had 25 years ago. And I saw this very recently with my own sister. And when I was talking the problem over with my daughter, I said, you have to be more understanding. I said, this is the way we were brought up to be, self-righteous. This was considered an honor. This was considered an asset. And uh, it was hard for her to understand, but she tried to. And I, I could thank God that I had burned my soapbox a couple of years back and didn't feel any need to have it anymore. But when I see people without a program, whether they're alcoholic or not, I'm grateful that I have one because somebody said before they have the solutions. And this is where I learned how to live and to live happily. And thank you all. I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to thank all the uh, old-timers that were here that didn't get to share. There'll be a meeting after this meeting you can share with somebody then. <laughs> no timer told me that. Uh, I've never had an original thought in Alcoholics Anonymous, I, but really that's not true. I was driving down the highway one day in, uh, in Louisville, Texas, and I had an original thought, something I'd never heard before in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I quickly forgot what it was. <laughs> And I wasn't even an old-timer yet. I mean, you know, so I, you know, my memory's never been that good. Uh, a couple of things. I want to thank Cenny. Uh, actually, Terry, Terry F., our delegate, he asked me last year if I would lead this meeting. And he asked me because I complained. So if you're an old-timer and uh, you got to complain about this meeting, see Terry, and maybe you can do it next year. <laughs> Or just go to your sponsor. I don't know. But I, anyway, I want to thank Kathleen for drawing the names out. So if your name wasn't called, go blame Kathleen. <laughs> Take the pressure right off of me. And um, I want to pay a special tribute to a friend of mine who passed away this year, Joel. I miss him dearly. We lost Jim T. over in Pearl River this year. Uh, there's others we lost, I don't know, old timers. Uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, speakers said uh, that the newcomer is the most important person here. They are the lifeline of Alcoholics Anonymous. But don't focus on that newcomer so much that you forget us old timers. We have bad days too. We need, we need people in Alcoholics Anonymous to tell us when they think we're off the beam. And if you tell me I'm off the beam, or you, you know, say in my opinion, I think you're off the beam, Roy, and I get bent out of shape, then you know you were right. <laughs> Absolutely know you were right. I got a favorite story in Alcoholics Anonymous. I heard it on a tape. A guy in Jerry, Jerry J from Dallas, Texas told it. He repeated it from an old timer that he had heard it from. And it's about these two cowboys that are out riding a range in West Texas. It's a hot summer day. It's The wind's blowing. It's dry. It's dusty. And they stop at a stock pond to uh, to get a drink of water, old cowboy and young cowboy. And uh, they, they water their horses, and they wet themselves down. They put water in their hat, and they dump it on them to cool off. And uh, around these stock tanks, you got cattle. And, you know, cattle have baby calves. And uh, there were some baby calf droppings there. And the old cowboy, right before they got on their horse to ride on, he reached down and he stuck his finger right in the fresh baby cow dropping. And he took that and he rubbed it all over his lips. And the young cowboy says, Say, will that cure chap lips? He said, No, but it'll sure keep you from licking them. And that's just like Alcoholics Anonymous. It doesn't cure alcoholism, but it sure keeps us from drinking. If you're here today, you're in the right place. If you got any doubts, come back tomorrow because they're going to give the answer tomorrow. 
So just keep coming. And with that, for those who would like to join me, we have a nice way of closing. Have a moment of silence for those suffering in and out of the rooms, followed by the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.